In the days and weeks after 9-11, the US decided to fight a war in the shadows. Americans should not expect one battle, but a lengthy campaign, unlike any other we have ever seen. It may include dramatic strikes, visible on TV, and covert operations, secret even in success. 14 years later, there's no end in sight. We will degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. So what does the US do now? And will this conflict ever end? To find answers, this week I've left the Oxford Union for the US Capitol. I'm here in Washington, D.C. to interview a man who, until very recently, was America's top military spy chief, the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, the DIA, and before that, a commander with JSOC, the elite military unit which helps run President Obama's shadow war. He's been called the father of the modern-day JSOC, whose kill-or-capture campaign stretches from Iraq and Afghanistan to Osama bin Laden's compound in Pakistan. But has the so-called war on terror now become a crusade? I've been at war with Islam, or a, or a component of Islam, for the last decade. And bonded by a common enemy, can the United States and the Islamic Republic of Iran finally work out their differences? I could go on and on all day about Iran and, and their behavior, you know, and their lies, flat out lies. And then they're, they're spewing of constant hatred no matter whenever they talk. I'm Mehdi Hassan, and in this special edition of the program, I'm going head to head with one of America's leading generals. I'll challenge Michael Flynn, the former head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, on the rise of ISIL, on torture, and on why he's opposed to a deal with Iran. There's no panel, no audience, just me and him. General Flynn, your former boss, President Obama, has said that his aim is to, quote, degrade and ultimately destroy the terrorist group known as ISIL. A year into the US-led bombing campaign of ISIL, how close is he to achieving those goals, in your view? Is he destroying, is he degrading ISIL, even? Yeah, I think that he's degrading them. I don't think that we'll ever destroy uh, this, this organization. I mean, we may cause it to change its name, but we are never going to destroy this organization. Destroy means completely in, eliminate uh, in, in military parlance that would be to Should to he not have used those words? He should not have used those words. Those were incorrect words to use and he should have been more precise and he should have, uh, dis he should have actually stated what I believe would be attainable goals, which would be to change the behavior. But, but it's not realistic, as you say. It's not realistic. It's you totally served unrealistic. under President Obama as his head of his defense intelligence agency right. at the Pentagon for two years. Uh, you're now out of government. You've been critical of some of the things he's done uh, since. What would you be doing differently to him in Iraq against ISIL? Yeah, I think that what we have to do is we have to read better what the Arab nations are in the Middle East, what they're saying. And I think that uh, there's a real uh, pull right now by many of the leaders in the Arab world. They definitely need U.S. support, but they know that they have to do this together. I would rather see the U.S. step up in a much bigger leadership role to be able to help them help themselves. And right now, uh, we're, not, we're not really doing that. I think we've wasted so much time. We've wasted so many years of just basically being inefficient at what is very doable to defeat this enemy, this threat. And you mentioned those Arab leaders. A lot of those Arab leaders have gone out of their way to say, let's fight ISIL, let's defeat ISIL, let's get rid of them, let's uh, ostracize them. But they've also made it very clear, don't blame the Arab world or the Muslim world for it. Don't blame Islam for it. These people are, are not representatives of Islam. They're against Muslims more than anyone else. And yet you said on Fox News not so long ago, quote, I have been at war with Islam or a component of Islam for the last decade. Isn't that the kind of inflammatory clash of civilizations, holy war yeah, so rhetoric let's not kid ourselves. that ISIL I mean, engages yeah, yeah, in. Aren't sure, you engaging in sure, the kind of stuff sure. that ISIL says? Isn't that what they want to hear? Let's You're not kid ourselves about what it is that we are facing. And we are facing, and the, the uh, Islamic world is facing an element within the religion of Islam that uh, is going to change it one way or the other, in my belief, change it for the, for the bad, for the negative, uh, if something is not done, but they have grabbed hold of this religion and they are using it in a very, very dangerous way. And if the, if the religious component, the, the moderate, you know, somewhat pro-moderate pro uh, component of Islam 
actually stands up to it, I believe that it can be defeated. Just on the phraseology, when you say you've been at war with Islam, right. that's not helpful a language. Is it? That gives no, ISIL. No, 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 I have. I've had arguments. I've, I've sat Islam room, is a religion of I've one sat with individuals billion plus just like people, you. and you're saying you're at war, you're at war with, with their religion. Doesn't that give ISIL what they want? Not ISIL, with say, a billion look, plus. ISIL not will be saying, look at that US general on Al Jazeera. He's saying he's at war with Islam. Come join us, yeah. defend Islam. Yeah. You're going to send recruits their way with language like that. We are at war with a radical component of Islam. And the way I believe it is that uh, Islam is a, it's a political ideology based on a religion. Islam is? That's what I believe. And, and that's how I... I Sorry, like do you mean the, Islamism or Islam? So I'm confused. Islamism. Here. Islamism. Okay. You're not saying better. the religion of Islam is, is a political, is a political ideology. ideology based on a religion. So my, when I say I've been at war with Islam, I mean, I've sat down with members of Al-Qaeda, members of the Taliban that are, that are my age. I mean, very well-educated guys. And and ask them why. What is it that we're that's that's going wrong somewhere that we're fighting each other? What is it that you what what is your excuse? And if the excuse is well the West is bad, you know the the Jews of Israel are bad. That's not a good excuse. A lot of terrorism and experts who have sat down with these guys, right. they say actually these guys are political. These guys are, as you say yourselves, they're a political yeah. group using agree. the religion as cover. I don't agree. The guys that are the serious the serious leaders of these groups absolutely believe that their version of Islam is the right you say version, they're serious is the correct leaders. version. We're now seeing reports that ISIL, the top ranks of ISIL, are filled with ex-Ba'athist army officers from the Saddam regime. They're not all religious fanatics, as you seem to imply. I mean, MI5, Britain's domestic intelligence agency, did a study of several hundred terrorists a few years right. ago and found, I quote, far from being religious zealots, a large number of those involved in terrorism do not practice their faith regularly and could actually be regarded as religious novices. I, I, I don't disagree with that, but I will tell you that there's, there is a sufficient number of leaders in, still in Al-Qaeda and definitely in this group we call ISIL. Uh, their, their religious beliefs are very strong. And therefore it's a religious war in your view? I think that it's a political war. I think it is a political war, but I think that they use the excuses that they have uh, applied Completely to be able agree to with you, this. but my worry is that you are indulging those excuses. You're allowing them to get away with making I, those what excuses. What I'm trying to do You're is giving them legitimacy. Define, I don't think so. I see how what they have done is this is a political ideology based on a religion. And to me, we have to come to grips with that. And yet, you, rather than go after the political ideology, you're going after the religion. Not necessarily. I think it's the political but ideology. When you say you're at war with face. Islam, you're going after the religion. If, it's, if I believe it's a political ideology, that's true. Okay, well, here in the West, especially here in the US, you hear a lot of this rhetoric right. about religion, Islam, uh, ISIS being the responsibility of right. certain Islamic scholars or Islamic groups. Uh, you hear lots of people say it's the responsibility of the Shia-led government in Baghdad, the mistakes that they've made in the recent years. Uh, you hear people say it's the fault of Assad and obviously the repression in Syria. You hear people blame the Gulf countries for allegedly funding some of these groups. Um, very conveniently, I often find, we hear very little about America's own responsibility in this conflict, in this mm -hmm. problem. Isn't it the case, General, that there would be no ISIL today in Iraq if the US hadn't invaded and occupied Iraq in 2003? Yeah, I think that looking back, uh, there were a number of strategic errors that were made. You have to look back over you know, 50, 60, 70 years and you can even look back longer, but we definitely put fuel on a fire that was... Were, that by had, uh, by had invading some, and the behavior that had happened. some embers there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's no doubt. There's no doubt. I mean, when we... You know, history will not be kind to the decisions that were made, uh, certainly in 2003. And here's the thing, I don't really Go, don't... Going into Iraq, yeah. de definitely not. And, and not just with Iraq, obviously there's Syria. You're yeah. on record as saying the handling of Syria by this administration has been a mistake. Many people would argue that the US actually saw the rise of ISIL coming and turned a blind eye, or even encouraged it as a counterpoint to Assad. And a secret analysis by the agency you ran, the Defense Intelligence Agency, in August 2012 said, and I quote, there is the possibility of establishing a not declared so or undeclared <laughs> Salafist, it's not secret anymore, it was released under FOI. The quote is, there is the possibility of establishing a declared or undeclared Salafist principality in eastern Syria, and this is exactly what the supporting powers to the opposition want in order to isolate the Syrian regime. The US saw the ISIL caliphate come and did nothing. Yeah, I think that what we, where we missed the point, I mean, where we totally blew it, I think, was in the very beginning. I mean, we're talking four years now into this effort in Syria. Most people won't even remember, it's only been a couple of years, the Free Syrian Army, that, that movement. I mean, where are they today? Al-Nusra, where are they today? And what have, how much have they changed? 
when you don't get in and help somebody, they're going to find other means to achieve their goals. And I think right now what we have allowed is... A whole new world helping them yeah, in 2012. we've allowed this, we've allowed this extremist... Were you know, these extremist militants to come in. But why did you and allow them to do that, General? Well, you were in those post. Are, those you were the head are, of the yeah, Defense right, Intelligence right. Agency. Well, those I, are, I, those I, are I policy I took the liberty, took those the liberty of printing issues. out that document. Yeah. This is yeah. the memo I quoted from. Did you see this document in 2012? Was this come across your table? One oh, of your yeah, yeah, yeah. I paid very close attention okay. to all this. So when you sure saw did. this, did you not pick up a phone and saying, what on earth are sure. we doing supporting I mean, that, these Syrian that, rebels? That kind of information is presented and... And what did you do about it? Those become, I argued about it. Did you say we shouldn't be supporting these groups? I did. I mean, we argued about these, the different groups that were there, and we said, you know, who is it that is involved here? And I will tell you that uh, I, I do believe uh, that the, the intelligence was very clear. And now it's a, it's a matter of whether or not policy is going to be as clear and as defining and as precise as it needs to be, and I don't believe it was. Just on, just on what you're saying, just to clarify here, you're saying today, today my understanding is you're saying we should have backed the rebels... You're saying in government, you agreed with this We analyst. should have done more earlier on in this effort, uh, you know, than, than we did. We, but we in really, 2012, we, but in we 2012 which was can. We we three, can, not, but three years ago, let's just be clear, just right. for the sake of our viewers. In 2012, your agency was saying, quote, the Salafists, the Muslim Brotherhood, and Al-Qaeda in Iraq are the major forces driving the insurgency in Syria. Mm -hmm. In 2012, the U.S. Yeah. was helping coordinate arms transfers to those same groups. Why did you not stop that if you're worried about the rise of quote unquote yeah, Islamic I, I, extremism? I mean, I hate to say it's not my job, but that my job was to was to ensure that the that the accuracy of our intelligence that was being presented was was as good as it could be. And I will tell you it, it goes before twenty twelve. I mean, when we were when we were in Iraq and we still had decisions to be made before there was a decision to pull out of Iraq in twenty eleven. I mean, it was very clear what we, were, what we were going to face. Well, I admire your frankness very on this subject. Very clear what we were going to let face. Me, let me just, to one before we move on, just to clarify once more, you are basically saying that even in government at the time, you knew those groups were around, you saw this analysis, sure. and you were arguing against it. But who wasn't listening? I think the, I think the administration. So the administration turned a blind eye to your analysis. I don't know the if they turned a blind eye. I think it was a decision. I think it was a willful decision. A willful decision to go support an insurgency that had Salafists, Al Qaeda, well, and a Muslim willful decision to do what they're doing, which which you have to really you have to really ask the president, what is it that he actually is doing with the with the uh, policy that is in place because it is very very confusing. I'm sitting here today, Matty, and I don't I can't tell you exactly what that is. And I've been at this for a long time. OK, well, let's go back to Iraq. I just want to ask you one right. last question about Iraq. Many would argue that the Iraq invasion was a recruiting sergeant for extremists and terrorists. You seem to have conceded partly that earlier on in this interview. You said that I think it we was added a, fuel I think it was to the a fire. Strategic I, think mistake. I think history will not be kind. It but let me just get very mistake. specific on Iraq. U.S. prisons in Iraq are believed to have helped radicalize thousands of young Iraqis yeah. who passed through them. Absolutely. Uh, not just through torture, but through providing a recruiting ground, a meeting yeah. place, a training facility for the very same militants yeah. that the U.S. is now bombing. I think 17 of the top 25 yeah, I, I, there's no, ISIL there's no commanders. Doubt, there's no doubt that the prison system that was, that was the Iraqi prison system became, uh, you know, places training ground, the, the, the training ground for what we're facing So it today. wasn't just 2003 that U.S. poured fuel on the fire. It was much later on as well. Well, I, US I don't think it was so much. It's not the U.S. so much. I, well, let, I, me, let me quote you, your former colleague, Major yeah. General Douglas Stone, who ran the U.S. Right, detention Stone, system right. in Iraq. He yeah. said he called the U.S. prison system a jihadi university that was breeding more terrorists. Yeah, I, I believe that. And he ran them. I believe that. I went, it's not I, just the Iraqis, I as you just down, said. It's I, the Americans. I went down there. Well, I mean, what we did was we allowed... We allowed things to happen in those prisons, in those detention facilities, in, in Camp Cropper and Camp Buka, to where guys like al-Baghdadi spawned, and others as well. And then when we turned those detention facilities over to Iraq, that became far worse because there was no standards in those prisons at all. You at least were, we had well, let's standards. Talk about, let's talk about standards. You were a senior official in the Joint Special Operations Command right. at that time, JSOC, right. which is the kind of elite, top secret unit uh, responsible for the killing of Osama bin Laden, among other things. Uh, you've been described as the father of the modern JSOC. Uh, and you mentioned Camp Bucker and Camp Cropper. And you mentioned standards. You didn't mention Camp Nama in Iraq, yeah. uh, which was nicknamed Nasty Ass Military Area. 
and where according to a New York Times investigation, US interrogators beat prisoners with rifle butts, spat in their faces, and used them for target practice in a game of paintball, where the motto was no blood, no foul, meaning interrogators couldn't be prosecuted if they visibly, if a detainee didn't visibly bleed. Are you telling me, A, those are standards you're proud of, and B, that didn't help? In no. the rise of ISIL? No, I mean obviously no. I mean those are not standards. They're not standards that I will ever be proud of. And my my role, my personal role, when you say the father of you know whatever, um, what I was asked to do, and this was post Abu Ghraib, so I was responsible for training interrogators who then went and that, abused these Iraqis. Who then, who then went in? I mean, I, so we 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 saw what was happening, but it's not the training that we were given these people. When when we saw what was happening inside of the whole Abu Ghraib scandal, my role, and it was July of 2004, I was asked to come in and basically fix that problem. We shut that place down as fast as I could. Listen to the verdict of Human Rights Watch in their report on Camp Nama. Yeah. Military intelligence battalion systematized the use of abusive techniques in Iraq in 2003-04, and military intelligence interrogators, including officers, are implicated in widespread abuses during that time. Yeah. How can you say you don't have any responsibility for what no, those interrogators No, I do. I, I feel, I always feel like I have responsibility. I'm not going to sit here and tell you I don't have responsibility. We all have responsibility, but... Um, but you didn't tell I, them to do what they did. No, and they're not trained. They weren't trained to do that. So I mean, do this it? is this is just this is poor leadership at its at its finest, if that's a if that's appropriate to say. You say, and you, there was no accountability at what, that time. For, what for accountability the, for, did you bring in, General? The accountability was to shut it down and to standardize it. Human Rights Watch says that Red Cross was blocked from Camp from Nama. there from Camp Nam. Why? Uh, you'll have to ask the folks that ran Camp Nam. You were the one of the commanding officers no, who turned I, I, up to no, clean No, I, I was the one that shut it down. I was did the one you, that helped shut it did down. Did you call for Red Cross to be allowed in in internal conversations? We, we did. Eventually, we did. Uh, Human Rights Watch says there are a few indications the military undertook but any not, systematic but not, but not in Camp Nam to investigate it was, it and prosecute a, abuses. Yeah, I'm sorry. In, Human Rights Watch says there were few indications the military undertook any systematic efforts to investigate or prosecute abuses. That's not true. There were individuals in, in uh, Iraq and in Afghanistan that uh, came under investigation and, and many were found, uh, those investigations were found substanti substantiated and those individuals were punished. How many interrogators from Camp Nama were prosecuted in a court of law? I don't know. I, I don't any? Know. I, I don't because know. internal I, punishments many, don't, don't really count though, do they? Yeah, do I don't know. I, 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 think that, uh, I think that our entire system is guilty. I think our entire system at that time was guilty. It was guilty of just totally inappropriate behavior but on the part of, of what we law, accept. Doesn't U.S. law and international law say that if you commit torture, you should be prosecuted in a court? You don't just get a Absolutely. slap on the wrist. So why haven't more people been prosecuted yeah, in court? I, I mean, you'd have to, you know, I hope, that in the, I hope that as more and more information comes out that people are, take, are held you, accountable. You have that information in your head, presumably. You went there and yeah, you shut it down. I, I, know, I know the ones that I was aware of, which was a few, quite a few. Let's talk about what you are aware of. You're on record as saying that you yourself physically interrogated detainees that you've been, quote, personally involved in thousands of interrogation operations. Just to clarify, did those interrogations that you were involved in, General, ever involve torture? No. And when we say torture, are we both no. agreeing on the definition of torture? Every single, waterboarding. every single one that I was involved in, I have no problems with. No waterboarding? Back, not, I mean, none of that. Nope, no, none of that. No, that was no beatings, no sleep deprivation, nope. none of that stuff. Nope. nope. None of the stuff we've heard about all those abuses. Nope. That's right. The reason I ask is... I mean, if I was asked to do anything, Medi, I was asked to take the standards that we were training and take this, the new doctrine that came out and get this thing under control. A again, history is not gonna look kind on, the, on those actions that you're describing right now and we will be held, we should be held accountable for many, many years to come. The reason I ask about your role is Esquire magazine reported in 2009, they quoted a soldier from Camp Nama mm -hmm. who said that a colonel named Mike was present in the interrogations when a lot of those abuses were going on. Was that Colonel you, General? No, no. So you were never present when any no, of those in abuses? In 2009, that was already... No, that wasn't when it was reported, but yeah, he's talking about yeah, the no. interview. I'll give you, my, my time in Camp Nama lasted about three days. Whether it's interrogations or drone strikes or assassinations or renditions or night raids or whatever it is, do you believe that your work in that so-called shadow war results in America being more secure today than it was after 9-11 because 14 years after 9-11 all the war on terror seems to have given us is more war and more terror it doesn't look like a success yeah. from where I'm sitting I think that we have invested in in more conflict instead of actually investing in solutions so when I when, and when I say that what I mean is that 
we invest in more drones, we invest in more bombs, we invest in more weapons, we invest in more ammunition, we invest in more guys to go out and kill more guys. That's investing in conflict. Instead of really taking a serious look and say, what, what, what are the big excuses that these guys are using? And if it's lack of, you know, if it's poor economic conditions, if it's poor social conditions, then let's fix those. But those kinds of things aren't gonna get fixed overnight. And the, and the leaders of the Middle East have to decide that that's what they want to do. You sound very reasonable. And, and the, expansion of, the expansion of these groups, so if you look at uh, 2004, and you fast forward to 2014, so only you know, less than a year ago, that the, the, the number of terrorists, our State Department designated terrorist groups have doubled. So something is wrong with our policy yeah. and our strategy. And, and here's what I don't get. When you talk about fixing the underlying problems, when right. you talk about not investing in conflict as the number one way of dealing right. with this, I agree with you, and you do sound very reasonable and persuasive. And yet in February, in front of Congress, you said when you were asked what is to be done, the enemy must be opposed, must be killed, must be destroyed. Yeah. There's, and that's, it's it's, there's a dove, General well, Flynn, no, and there's a hawk, no, I mean, General I, No, there's, there are elements within this organization that, are, that the only way to deal with them is they either have to be captured and put away in, a, in some legitimate prison system that will actually hold them for Not a certain period Nama, of time. we hope. Or, or, they will have to be, uh, or they have to be killed. I mean, that's a component of, of, an, of, a, of a much, much broader strategy. The military has to be like a, a lowercase m. I mean, it is so indecisive. It is not the, the piece that is going to win the day. There has to be other components of a strategy, and I don't see them. I don't see them. I see us, I see us making the military component the principal effort from our perspective, and I just don't see any other real strong informational, diplomatic, or primarily economic component to this thing. And uh, frankly, the, the, the region needs to come to the table and say, this is how we believe we can end this. Thing. You say the region needs to come to the table, and yet you talk about the kind of failures of the military side. I'm yeah. asking about you, the role you played. You were JSOC, right. which right. did this quote unquote shadow yeah, so war. So you keep saying Camp Nama, but we closed Camp Nama. You closed Camp was, Nama, but then you did renditions. You did drone strikes. That, that's, you did that's, night that's, raids. That's not my, that was not my responsibility, and I hate to say it. JSOC like that, wasn't but responsible no. for any drone strikes, really? Well, for drone strikes. Which yeah. have been, a, yeah, which yeah, have yeah. been hugely counterproductive yeah. on the yeah. counterterrorist front. Yeah. Many analysts have argued. But the rendition thing is different. The rendition thing is a different issue. But the drone strikes are different. Yeah, that's different. That's another show for another show. 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 That's another the show for you. Well, maybe another show, but the <laughs> drone strikes, for example, many have argued they create more terrorists than they kill. The night raids in Afghanistan, I, I many have argued uh, yeah, they I, create more terrorists I, I than, they, than they get. I don't disagree with that. I, I think that that's, in, that's conflict. When you invest in but conflict, respect, so General, when you that's drop your a failure, bomb, then, isn't it? When you drop a bomb from a drone, you're investing, you're, you are going to cause more damage than you're going to cause good. And I think that so do you think President Obama should be not ramping up drone strikes, as he has done, but yeah. actually ramping them down, as his predecessor yeah, did? I think that there should be a different approach. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Well, I, 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 do think, believe, I, I do believe, though, Matty, that there are individuals that they, will, they believe in perpetual conflict on, the, uh, on these Islamic radical uh, front, so to speak. So they, and they've talked about perpetuating conflict for the rest of time. I mean, some of these guys have written about it. So we have to understand that. Okay. So there's some that, that that's okay for, but, but I think as, a, as an overarching strategy, it's a failed strategy. Uh, on that note, uh, let's leave it there. We're going to take a break now on Head to Head. Uh, join me in part two, where I'll be discussing Iran and its controversial nuclear program with General Flynn. I'll ask him why he thinks the Iranians can't be trusted and why he believes doing a deal with them is dangerous. That's after the break. After decades of mistrust, states like these and their terrorist allies constitute an axis of evil. Animosity. It is America and their agents who promote terrorism. And mutual accusations. Iranian authorities fail. Iran and the United States have reached a nuclear agreement. While the dealmakers believe the plan will prevent Iran from building a nuclear bomb, its critics have branded it a calamity. The other Sunni Arab nations will not sit by and watch Iran acquire nuclear weapons. So is it a fresh start or a fatal mistake? Stop Iran now. Reject this deal. And can old foes ever become real friends? This deal is not built on trust. It is built on verification. The hostility goes back more than 60 years and was triggered by oil. 
flanked by the great land masses of Asia and Africa, lies the ancient kingdom of Persia. In 1953, Washington and London orchestrated a coup to overthrow the elected prime minister of Iran, Mohammad Mossadegh, who had nationalized the then British-controlled oil industry. Can mutual understanding solve the present crisis, preserving for mankind oil from the wells of Persia? In his place, the US propped up the Shah, whose corrupt and despotic reign bred discontent. The royal couple were treated to the first ballet ever performed in the White House. In 1979, the people of Iran rose up in revolution. Autocracy became theocracy. The US became the great Satan. 52 Americans were taken hostage for 444 days when Iranian students stormed the embassy in Tehran. And the crisis prompted an end to diplomatic relations. As we drove along the deserted main street, the extent of damage and death became clear. In the 1980s, the rift widened when the US backed Iraq's invasion of Iran. Your country is now helping Iraq. With Washington's quiet acquiescence, Saddam Hussein deployed chemical weapons against Iranian forces. And to make things worse, <laughs> as the war was drawing to a close, the US military shot down an Iranian passenger plane, killing all 290 civilians on board. This man's burden was heavy, searching for the bodies of five of his relatives. <laughs> Decades of verbal attacks and crippling sanctions followed, while the US accused Iran of being behind Hezbollah's attacks, including the infamous bombing of a US Marine barracks in Beirut, which left 241 Americans dead. Iran remains the world's primary state sponsor of terror. Today, Iranian mobs continue to chant death to America. But since reformist Hassan Rouhani became president in 2013, the tide has begun to turn. You can't use war to stop a war. On July 14, 2015, a milestone nuclear agreement was finally reached. This deal offers an opportunity to move in a new direction. While for many, celebration, euphoria and hope mark the day, the question remains, is this the beginning of a new friendship or are these two countries destined to remain the best of enemies? Welcome back to Head to Head on Al Jazeera. My special guest tonight is retired General Michael Flynn, who was President Obama's top military intelligence official right up until August of 2014, and is a former Special Operations Commander too. General, for more than three decades now, the US and Iran have been bitter enemies. Isn't it time now to bury the hatchet, to find some common ground, to end this kind of never-ending cold war between your two countries. Yeah, and I and I have. I mean, I will tell you, Matty, for many years uh, in the in the commanders that I have worked for, when I when I have been asked, I've been very pro. We have to do something with Iran. We have to talk to Iran in some form or fashion, but we've got to do it in a way that uh, that also recognizes their. Uh, their really bad behavior over the three plus decades, three and a half decades that, that, uh, that frankly, the Mullahs have been in charge of that country. Whenever you speak to American officials or former officials, mm -hmm. they talk about Iranian bad behavior, undeniable yeah, as it undeniable, is. Yeah, it's undeniable, that's right. But when you talk to Iranians or Iranian officials, they'll say, what about American bad behavior? We never sure. hear about America's support for the Shah, for the toppling of Mohammad Mossadegh, the Iranian prime minister, sure. for the support of Saddam's invasion of Iran, the shooting down of Iranian airliner. There's enough bad behavior to go around on all sides, isn't there? But it's not, you know, you know so I'm not going to disagree with you on those, on those issues. We can't, those are but, facts. Yeah, they're facts, but, but it's, you know, it's so consistent. Their bad behavior, Iran's bad behavior is so consistent, and it's so often, and it's, and it's just continuous. At some point in time, this is a country, Iran is a country that's got a, it's got a uh, well-educated society. I mean, there's so many positives that, and so much potential for them to contribute to the greater good of the world, yet they don't. They've decided that they're not going to do that. They've decided that they're going to be a pariah state instead of a contributing they state. They would argue they've been made a pariah state when they were invaded then by Saddam Hussein. They then, didn't get the support of the then, world. Then Saddam got the support of the world. Act differently. Then, then change your behavior. Change your behavior. Well, they would argue that the these negotiations that have been, we've been yeah. seeing in recent years between the Obama administration right. and the Iranian government is an example of change behavior. I don't see it. 
I don't see the changed behavior. I mean, I think that they violated, they continue to violate the sanctions. They continue to, to support uh, with weapons and other capabilities, uh, you know, bad behavior. You I mean, they're, they're doing them, they're doing things, and they're frankly working with, with certain countries that are allowing the sanctions to be busted. So, I mean, just, you, you know, get, get to a point where you accept your role in the world, and I think for Iran, they need to accept where they are going to be, where do they well, want to be in the future. You can't have both ways, generals. You can't say we want to isolate them with sanctions, but they've got to play a positive part in the world. You've got to pick one or the other. That's what the Obama administration is doing. The reason why the sanctions, from if you you know go way back, is because of bad behavior. Okay. Well, you claim and you've dismissed uh, President Obama's nuclear negotiations as flawed, as right. dangerous, as a false choice. You've called it wishful thinking. Right. Why? Because I don't, I think that the assumptions that, um, I believe the assumptions that it is based on are really false assumptions. It's a lack of understanding of not just Iran, but the entire region. And I think one of the assumptions that was made, a strategic assumption that has been made with these is the, the sensibilities of the rest of the region. How would the rest of the region Go, how is the rest of that, of the Middle East, going to respond? And when I say the Middle East, really the Arab world, how is it going to respond? And I think that there were some, some assumptions that were made that are, that are not uh, good assumptions. But again, you seem to be having your cake and eat it. On the one hand, you say Iran is a major bad behavior, major right. bad player. It's sponsor of bad groups. It's busting sanctions. Uh, and you're talking about the worry. I mean, you're worrying about, you're you worrying do, about Maddie, the stability. Look at the international, general, look at the international association general. of of inspectors, look at what the inspectors have said. The IAEA it, have said that Iran is not no. building a nuclear weapon. That is what they've look, said. Look at some of the- And the IAEA is the group that's the, gonna be the, empowered by a nuclear yeah. deal. Look at some of the, uh, the results of some of what they have said. And it's like, these guys are not following through on what they're supposed to be doing. That's just on the nuclear issue. But taking a wider point about the region, isn't the whole way you get stability in the region by bringing Iran into the fold, by bringing it in from the I cold? I do. So I think the Rather region, than treating it like this yeah. kind of child so, that you patronize and dismiss. Yeah, I don't think we're patronizing Iran well, You talk at about all. Iran like a kind of a, no. like an unruly child. Well, I mean, they're definitely a, a, uh, a nation state that has demonstrated behavior that is unacceptable to international norms and laws. And right. they don't accept accountability for any of their actions. So that's... So putting that aside... Here's a, here's a country look, that is helping you which fight country? ISIS. Iran is helping America fight ISIL in Iran. For their own purposes. Ha but nevertheless, still helping the United States. They helped the United States fight the Taliban they also in killed, Afghanistan They also in killed a lot of Americans in Iraq. I'm not I denying mean, that. I'm saying to you... they also killed a lot of Americans in Beirut and, Mer and Americans in other embassies around the world. So, I mean, it's a funny... And there's plenty of documents suggesting that some of your Gulf allies mm -hmm. have supported groups that have killed sure. Americans. Sure. Uh, there are plenty of documents that show many of your other allies have worked against you. The sure. point is you only single out this one country. I think that there should have been some decisions made before Iran came in to the discussion that said, here is going to be the framework that we are going to abide by and then bring Iran in. But I also think that the, I also strongly believe that the rest of the region should have been part of the conversation as we went forward with this thing. How would you control or contain or curb yeah. whatever you want to use so, I mean, Iran's it, you nuclear know, we're, program? We're looking Very at, briefly. We're looking at hindsight. I would have brought in other players up front, and I would have definitely brought in the rest of the region to let the rest of the region know this is how we are going to proceed. Here are the rules of engagement. What are those rules? Yeah, I'm, I, I'm asking you what you would have done differently to President Obama. Yeah, I, I think, I think uh, you know, what we're going to expect out of Iran, I think nuclear development, I think changing the economic system in the Middle East is vital. I think, I think all that, the entire region needs to change General, its you're not economic system. My, you're not answering my question. How would you have got Iran's nuclear facilities to do the, pre the president's proposed deal yeah. is to reduce the number of centrifuges, reduce, increase the number of inspections, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How Man would you have got results similar to that? Tactically mandate that they open up all their facilities And Iran says no, then what? Then keep them, keep them at bay and not allow them to have nuclear weapons. But every single nuclear expert agrees that keeping them at bay, keeping the status quo, allows them to carry on enriching uranium. And they've gone from 160, I think, centrifuges yeah, to 20,000 20, right. under your system, under the yeah. status quo. Right. So why do you think it would work again? Isn't doing the same so, thing again are, and again? See, you're, I mean, you're arguing, you're arguing their bad behavior. You just no, I'm, I'm to saying to you... They were able to do that. I'm saying to you, I'm saying the, to you, you're opposed sanctions. to a deal yeah. that brings Iran in from the cold and puts right. curbs on a nuclear program. You're yeah. saying you don't like that deal. I'm saying, how would you get Iran to curb its nuclear program? Apart from telling them off, I've right. not heard a single practical proposal from you. So I, I think at this, 
Would you bum them? What I would do is I would take a big step back, because we're here and now. This is where we are. We need to change the economic, the ecosystem of the entire Middle East. Otherwise, we're talking about a region that will go to far, far greater conflict in the future. Right now, that region is built on essentially oil. I mean, let's face it. And the price of a barrel of oil is very low, not going to change. And I, my belief is that, and we know that nuclear development of some type is going to happen. We already see the Saudis, the Jordanians, the Egyptians. Will, do you believe Iran will get a bomb as a result of these negotiations? I believe if it goes the way it's going, yes, I do. I, and, yet the, I and yet the director... Do. And I don't think it's going to take 10 years to And yet the there. director of the CIA, John Brennan, former colleague yep. of yours in the intel community, he's called it a good deal and accused critics such as yourself who say it'll lead to a bomb sure. as being, quote, wholly disingenuous. The director of the CIA basically says you're lying. Yeah. I don't think he's saying I'm lying. He I, says you're I, wholly I, I disingenuous. Him, I, That's I a euphemism I heard him for lying, John. I heard him made those comments when he, when he spoke uh, um, a month or so ago. You know, I look at this and I say, look, the assumptions were flawed going in. Uh, we, are in a, we are at a place now where this is not just about nuclear weapons. This is about changing a system inside of the Middle East that the Arab world recognizes it must change. I appreciate if that. If they don't figure out this but that's this a diversion for the purpose it, of it, our it, conversation. Yeah, I'm asking about diversion. the nuclear program. Yeah, the nuclear program. We can make the Arab world becomes a wonderful home Iran of democracies tomorrow. Iran will have a tomorrow. nuclear weapon in some period of time less than 10 years. You if, know that for a fact, do you? No, I don't know it for a fact, but I, I, if, I look at, if I look at other historic you examples... You believe Iran is intent on building a nuclear If I look weapon. at other historic examples, and North Korea is the best one, but there's others, that uh, they will have a nuclear weapon. And that's they not are the, but that's not the view. Having a nuclear Just to be weapon. clear, you're an ex-member of the U.S. intelligence community. Right. That is right. not the view of the U.S. intelligence community that you were part of until August of last year. Yeah, I don't think so. You do think that's the view I, of the I U.S. I think that's the view of some. Well, James Clapper, who's the director right. of national intelligence, told Congress in February, we do not know whether Iran will eventually decide to build nuclear weapons. What yeah, do you know you uh, that the director of yeah. national intelligence doesn't know? What I look at is I look at what, are, what have been the behaviors what have been the statements, and what is the intent. And I try to read into that intent. Right? I try to read into those things. With and, respect, that's what we heard and, about Saddam Hussein. And this and gets, we know back, how that to, this out gets back to understanding. That's right. This gets that's back to understanding what it is that, we are, uh, that we're you, facing. Hold on, I believe say, Iran is going to have a nuclear weapon. And yet your reasoning for that, which you just outlined for yeah. us, is exactly the reasoning offered by Dick Cheney and co. in 2003 yeah, that, in relation to Saddam mistake. and Iraq. Totally. And yet you're making the same mistake again. No, I don't think so. I think that... You're he, repeating he had, the same rhetoric. Saddam had, uh, he had chemical weapons. He had capabilities. He definitely had them. What, what uh, the, the, you know, the poor intelligence that, that was displayed... But also poor time. thinking. It and was an very assumption. Lack of imagination. And yet you're Total making the same assumptions today. You're saying no, that I, I believe I'm that they're going to build a weapon, but I don't have any evidence yeah, for what that. What I'm trying but to do, Mehdi, is I'm trying to get us to use our imagination and think differently about this. But this deal lacks imagination because it's solely focused on one very narrow thing, the development of nuclear weapons. Instead of, let's take this up and say, how can we take this group this P5 plus one and Iran, and maybe brought in the other members of the region and say, how can we change from, a, from an investment in conflict to an investment in basically a new life for you these people of, of the Arab world? <laughs> if it goes in this direction, Mehdi, this and is a general, bad direction to go in. Not just a bad direction. According to you, it's wishful thinking. It's on wishful the president's thinking. Part. And yet people like Zbigniew Brzezinski, General Brent Skoker, former national security advisors, people like Ephraim Halevi, former right. head of Israeli Mossad, right. uh, variety of nuclear oh, specialists in the United States, uh, Admiral William Fallon, former head of Central Command, sure. they've all come out and backed this deal on exactly the grounds you're saying you oppose yeah. it. They're saying it will open up well, new let's, possibilities let's, in the so region. Let's, this is a bit of a hypothetical, but this is happening as we speak. So we have nuclear agreements being signed with Saudi, with the Saudis, with jo the Jordanians, and with the Egyptians, and possibly, if I understand it right, if I read it right, maybe even in Tunisia. So those are nuclear agreements between those nations and Russia, because Russia is a is a nuclear developer. You believe they're all going to get nuclear weapons. That's your worry. Oh, it's going to... If there's one thing I learned in the military a long, long time ago, and there's the phrase, be for it, when it is going to occur. It 
now equals nuclear development of some type in the Middle East. There are plenty of and, analysts and, and who disagree with you on that. Oh, I'm telling you, it's going to happen. It is going and to yet happen. Israel, so what Israel has had nuclear weapons so in that region going, since the 60s, and that didn't prompt a nuclear What we're going to see is race. we're going to see either, and I, what I, where, where I'm involved and where I hope for, is that we have nuclear energy development because it also helps for projects like desalinization and, and nuclear energy getting is fine. water. It's legal. Nuclear it's energy would be great nu if it was nuclear energy. In theory, the best case, <coughs> excuse me, the best case would be no nuclear. That's not going to happen. You would like to see a region, Middle East, I, free of nuclear. Yeah, but that's, that's ridiculous. Well, is that what you would like? Can I just I confirm I would love that? to see it. So you would I'd like to see Israel see give up its 200 I nuclear warheads? I would love to see it, but it's not practical because actually nuclear energy is very clean and it actually is, it, it is so cost effective, much more cost effective for producing okay, so then what's water the from desalinization. So then why don't we just welcome nuclear energy and keep carry on it. efforts to stop nuclear weapons? I would weapons? love it. I would love it. Okay, so we're all on the same page. One I mean, last I, think, I think that's the, that, but, but it has to be done in a very internationally inspectable way. That's and, exactly and, what's happening yeah. right now, General. You no. keep, you keep mm. well, the majority of experts disagree with you respectfully. You keep going on about the Iranian threat and you began this part by talking about Iranian right. bad behavior. Isn't it the case, General, that Iran, for all its bad behavior, in terms of threat levels, is unlikely to initiate or intentionally uh, provoke a conflict or launch a preemptive attack on the United States? Iran. Well, I think no. I don't think that's... You don't agree I, with that statement? I don't think that's a true statement. That, statement, that's general, true that statement. statement, General, is your statement yeah. from February 2014. I, I don't think that's a true statement because... So were you lying when you well, said it I last think, year? I, I, think it's, I think the word is directly. Now, if you say... Your, your against, word. I know, I know. You I said know. unlikely. Let me just yeah. clarify. Unlikely to initiate or intentionally provoke a conflict right. or launch a preemptive attack on the United States. Those right. are your words. I think as what we have DIA. to do is we have to look at... Uh, our embassies around the world. I mean, a direct attack would be on the, sovereign, the sovereignty of the United States. I think Iran attacking like, a, like an Al-Qaeda 9-11 type of attack is unlikely. That's, not, that's unlikely. So you still stand on by the that soil, Yeah, on the soil so it's of not the United incorrect. States. It's not, it's not incorrect. It's not incorrect. I think that that's true. Barack Obama has staked much of his presidency and his foreign affairs legacy yeah. on his handling of Iran. Uh, do you believe he's been risking uh, U.S. national security in doing so, uh, putting American or even Israeli lives at stake? I, I think it's been a dangerous approach to, the, to U.S. national security, yes, I do, because I don't think that he has taken in the totality of Iranian behavior for at least the last three and a half decades. Uh, you know, and I have the, the, the past history with the United States, but we have to not, we have to worry about the past and we have to recognize where we made mistakes and where others made mistakes. But we have to think about what is the future that we are trying to achieve. And I believe that it's very, very narrow. It's, 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 it's a very narrowly viewed future. We have to think about the next 10 years, the next 50 years, the next century. So when you hear and there are there are solutions that can get us there. So when you hear people like Senator Lindsey Graham saying the president has failed miserably to protect America or Senator John McCain uh, calling him the most naive president uh, in history, is that a critique you share? I think that uh, those are, uh, th from those gentlemen, I think that those are, uh, those are certainly what they believe. I, I share some of that. I think that um, they're also talking about uh, the Islamic State and the rise of the Islamic State, the rise of terrorism. So I, I think if they, you know, if, if what they're talking about is that whole context, then I share it. And I believe that we have to be very circumspect about what has, what kinds of actions have we brought forward in the Middle East that have caused this expansion of this rise of Islamic extremism and also this behavior that Iran has had over many decades. Just on, on the president's national security policies, here's what's interesting. Uh, here in Washington, D.C., you hear a lot of people across the political spectrum, but especially on the right, saying he's weak, uh, he's not tough enough. He apologizes to all our enemies. Uh, you know, he's given up some of the successes that he inherited, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then across the world, and I'm sure some of our viewers will share this view, you have people who say, Barack Obama? I mean, this is a guy who's ramped up drone strikes in Pakistan, killed US citizens without trial, toppled Colonel Gaddafi in Libya, uh, is back in Iraq bombing yeah. ISIL, surged troops in Afghanistan, uh, sent Navy SEALs in to kill bin Laden. So the critique elsewhere in the world is actually, it's not that he's too soft, it's that he's, he's as hard as George Bush was. He was too He's too tough. Yeah, I, I think he's too tactical. So the, the, the examples that you just gave, Mehdi, those are all tactical examples. And I think drone strikes is a tactic. Um, we, need, we need big leadership and we need big strategic vision right now. 
strategic vision that, the, that all, I, I believe only the United States can provide, frankly, because just the scale of what the United States can offer the rest of the world, and we need big strategic visionary leadership that, that, that solves a problem in the Middle East that the rest of the world is part of. You know, the word abandonment has been used by multiple people from multiple countries about the United States. We feel abandoned. That's not a good place for us to be, and those are pretty senior people. But on, these those, on, on those, lead, on those kind of leaders so who rely on the U.S. So to keep them in power. So if we, we're, if we're dropping drones and we're killing, you know, this guy or that guy, and we're, you know, training 60 guys, I mean, those are tactical, you know, narrow things that will never. Those are investments in conflict, in greater conflict. They are not investments in real strategic solutions. And there are strategic solutions for this region. And and frankly, an entirely new economy is what this region needs. They need to take this 15-year-old to 25 or 30-year-old. I mean, Saudi Arabia, the, the largest segment of their population. In Egypt, the largest segment of their population. 15 to roughly 30-year-old, mostly young men. You've got to give them something else to do. If you don't, they're going to turn on their own governments. And we can solve that problem. And yet the United States backs those governments in Saudi Arabia and Egypt that are seen and as so that's so gotta be, that has to be a conversation that we have. Yeah, so that's a conversation that we have to have with them, and we have to help them do that. And in the meantime, and, and allow and in the meantime we carry on giving them weapons, well, in, supporting in the meantime, their conflicts. In the meantime, what we have is Turning we have, a blind eye to human rights meantime, abuses. In the meantime, what we have is we have this continued investment in conflict. The more weapons we give, the more bombs we, we drop, that just... That just fuels the, the, the conflict. Some of that has to be done, but I'm looking for the other solutions. I'm looking for the other side of this argument. And, given, and, and well, we're not this having a, it. Well, given this is we're the part we're of not your, having it as Given the this US. is the part of your narrative that I agree with, yeah. let's wrap up on that point. But okay. let me ask you one question before I go. You've been very critical of President Obama and American strategy in recent mm -hmm. years. Um, have you considered running for office yourself now mm -hmm. you've left the military? That's, America has a long history of I've been generals. Asked. I have been asked. I have been asked. But I, you know, <laughs> right now, I mean, God, why? Which party? Because you're a registered Democrat, I believe. Yeah, yeah. But um, you, yet many would say you well, sound like a Republican. Well, it's funny because it depends on where, well, I'm a, what I am is I am a realist. And, uh, and I'm someone who, who has done, spent my, most of my life on, based on, you know, our national security. So, you know, I, I, uh, my answer is, you know, thank you for considering it, but it's just not something that I'm interested in. Not right now. Not right now. I mean, it's just, it's, it, God, I mean, look at politics. It's so ugly. But to quote the president on Iran, all options are on the table. Yeah, all options are always on the table. The you know, to, to, for, for, to finish real quick, the last uh, one of the things I learned as a, as a military guy is the best plan gives you the most options at the last possible minute. So I'm going to maintain all of my options right up until the last possible minute. Okay, well, that's all we have time for here on this head-to-head -head special from Washington, D.C. Uh, General, thank you very much for Thanks, joining Manny. me here very in the nice studio. To meet you. Uh, thank you all at home for watching. Next week, we'll be back in the Oxford Union in front of an audience for a new episode of Head to Head. Good night.